Hello, welcome to the comic book commentary. I'm Bo Leidig. And after last week looking at Spawn number one and seeing that really awesome picture of Pitt at the end of the book, I couldn't help myself and I thought, man, I really need to talk about Pitt number one this week. So let's zoom in and take a closer look. After I uploaded last week's video, I did realize that I didn't do any close-up shot of the front cover of the book. I thought it'd be really, really poor taste if I didn't get a close-up shot of Dale Keown's phenomenal artwork on the cover of this book. As you can see, this is the quote-unquote ripping first issue. Uh, it came out in January of 1993. Let's open it up and see what's inside. Created by Dale Keown, Pencils and Inks Dale Keown, Writer, Brian Houghton, Letterer, Chance Wolf, Colorist, Joe Shioto, Editor, Sasha Lemelin, Color Separator, Ollie Optics, Pit Pinups, Sam Keith, and Jim Somerville. I should point out before we get started, this is the only issue of Pit that was printed on newsprint. Apparently Dale didn't care for the way that the book turned out on newsprint. I don't know if he was upset about the way that the colors looked, or if he felt that his line work didn't look good in newsprint. But for whatever reason, uh, starting in issue number two, it would be printed exclusively on gloss print paper, which really does have a more premium feel to it and wasn't quite the norm in 1993, uh, even though today's books are almost all printed on gloss paper and it's somewhat of a rarity to see something printed on newsprint. Uh, we can see here in the top of the left corner that this is starting out in New York City and we see a biker gang. Now, I should point out, in the early 90s, at any point, if a biker gang shows up in a comic book, it's almost a 100% guarantee that they're up to no good. Uh, we can see clearly here that the lead biker is drinking and driving while on his motorcycle, and that he's stopped in his tracks and says what the expletive deleted in a censored swear word, which again is really weird to see in these early image comics, as in today's world, image comics just don't seem to care much about censoring this sort of thing. We see here on page number two that they were stopped in their tracks because they saw Pitt walking down the middle of the street totally naked. This is probably enough to stop almost anyone in their tracks. What's very strange about it over here on page number three, is that once again, we see a group of people with villainous intent not even remotely phased by what they're looking at. Pitt is a nine foot tall, 800 pound muscle monster that these guys are not even slightly intimidated by. In fact, their first instinct is to attack him for no reason whatsoever. And with melee weapons, because... Of course you want to get within arm's reach of a giant hulking monster. So the first biker approaches Pitt and hits him in the back of the head with a baseball bat. The second biker, though, appears to be armed with what is some sort of medieval flail and hits Pitt in the side of the face with it. I don't know why a biker in 1993 would be armed with a medieval flail, but hey, it was edgy. It was the 90s. It was that kind of time. I would like to point out that right here, you'll notice that the ball at the end of the chain is smooth, whereas in the next panel, it's covered in cracks. I don't know if this was a continuity error or if it was meant to show that the ball itself cracked after impacting Pitt's face. Uh, Pitt's not totally invulnerable, as you can see, he is bleeding. However, he is incredibly strong. As you can see, he's barely phased by being hit twice in the head by guys riding motorcycles with blunt impact weapons. Uh, on the very next page, number five, we see that the bikers somehow are not deterred at all by the fact that this guy just weathered both of their attacks. So, of course, they're going to make another run at him. The first guy gets caught in the face and has his head slammed directly through the pavement. I'm quite certain at this point he's dead. 
The second guy gets caught in the midsection with an elbow and knocked clean off of his bike, while the bike from the first guy right here is running into someone else and probably killing them as well. Pitt, not so much of the Batman mentality where people deserve to go to jail and be judged by a jury of their peers. Here on pages 6 and 7, we only have two panels that span across both pages. But man, they are great panels. Look how fantastic this artwork is. Dale Keown never fails to deliver. Of course, it's a Dale Keown book, so we can count on lots of striations. But I'd also like to point out that this biker gang, who are a bunch of criminals, seem to be severely lacking in the gun department. You will notice that everyone featured on this page is all wielding melee weapons. It's really odd that none of them have a gun. As you can see, the guy with the knife right here is killed pretty much immediately. I mean, there's always the possibility that he's not dead, but the fact of the matter is that Pitt just punched him full force in the face, so we can only assume that he didn't survive. I'd also like to point out that there's the use of made-up comic book words to express the sound of punches. Never get tired of that. I really love it when comic books do that, even if it's supposed to be a really gritty comic like Pitt, it's still nice to see that they're having a little bit of fun with it as well. Here on page number eight, we have more action sequences. Pitt's getting angry. He's throwing motorcycles all over the place. Guys are going down. No one is scared yet. And finally, the leader of the biker gang decides that it's time to pull out a shotgun and finally shoot this monster straight in the gut. And, of course, has to quote Scarface while doing so, because why wouldn't he? You'll notice that this actually does finally bring Pitt to his knees, but he's not down for the count. He's just really irritated. And the bikers at this point are starting to realize that they've made a grave mistake. Here on pages 10 and 11, we get a vertical action shot because early 90s image comics really love making it difficult for me to make these videos. Uh, I'd like to point out that the lead biker here has flubbed the reload, not that it would have really mattered, and that all of the rest of the gang has just realized that their night is about to get really, really bad. As Pitt is leaping towards them, yelling as at the top of his lungs, we also see a young boy who wakes up in the middle of the night also screaming at the top of his lungs. The young boy in question is waking up in Connecticut, far away from New York, and it should be pointed out that this is Timmy, who is not named in this book, and is actually very closely connected to Pitt, as we'll find out in future issues. His grandfather hears him scream, comes to try and comfort him, because as we can see down here on the bottom left, Timmy's parents have recently been killed. This story takes place as part of Youngblood number four, which I have to go through my collection and see if I have. Uh, I never really made a conscious effort to collect Youngblood comics, and I have picked them up here and there, so I may have that book. And if I find it, I will do a commentary on that as well, just so that we can see the backstory of this story. Uh, the next scene is in the New York City Police Department. As we can see, a large number of detectives. There's the newest detective to the force, Bobby Harris. She's a no-nonsense, very by-the-books, I'm-gonna-do-my-job-and-you're-not-gonna-tell-me-I-can't type of woman. Uh, I'd also like to point out that we can see right here one of the detectives is pouring coffee into a Bart Simpson mug, and this detective right here, his last name is Smithers. I'm not sure if that's a coincidence or if it's just a cheeky joke by Dale that he wanted to throw in there for fun. Here we can see that Smithers is somewhat surprised that Harris is his new partner. Uh, they're currently investigating the events that led to the death of Timmy's parents. As you can see here, Pitt is filmed on an ATM camera that was in the subway where the events of that attack took place. Um, they're not certain what's going on, where Pitt is from, if he's part of Youngblood. Once again, 
Youngblood is a state-sponsored superhero team in the Image Universe, basically Image version of the Avengers, if you will. It's not even an if you will. I mean, they're basically the Avengers. It's not too cleverly concealed a ripoff of the Avengers. Uh, on the very next page, we see Pitt is now fully clothed in things that he took from the bikers, including all of their chains, because if you're going to like take all the stuff from the bikers, why wouldn't you take their chains and wrap them all around you? Because it looks super awesome. Uh, again, it's pretty amazing that some of these clothes fit Pitt, given the fact that a, he's nine feet tall and a giant muscle man. But, you know, that's comic book logic. It's the same as you would see in the Hulk, which coincidentally is what Dale Keown was drawing for before he left Marvel to go and start Pitt with Image Comics. Uh, this is also the first instance that we see of Pitt having a conversation with a voice in his head. This isn't fully explained in this book, but it does continue for some time and we do get a glimpse into a little bit of Pitt's origin going forward. On the next page, we see that there is an unnamed alien race that we are somehow suddenly transported to on perhaps a spaceship or another planet. Uh, this race, while not named, uh, we get a small glimpse into their culture here. They seem to be very much in a pursuit of higher enlightenment. Um, some sort of telekinetic exercise is taking place here where um, I guess a mentor alien is trying to teach another alien how to use said telekinetic powers when they are suddenly attacked by an alien race known as the Creed. The Creed, of course, are the early villains in this comic and we can see that this guy down on the bottom is clearly in charge and he is up to no good. On the next page we see that Pitt has now decided to steal one of the motorcycles that belong to the gang because if he can wear clothes that are far too small for him he can also ride motorcycles that are far too small for him. It's hilarious to see this image of Pitt riding this tiny motorcycle to me, but, you know, why not? I mean, it's just one of those comics that's, it's so gritty and trying to be based in reality, but at the same time, it never feels full of itself at all. There's still these moments of, like, just goofball comic book logic that just feel right at home. Uh, underneath here, we can see that the New York Police Department is investigating the scene of the subway attack, which led to the death of Timmy's parents. This woman here, who I believe works for the New York Transit Authority, is very upset about the fact that the police are doing this because the subway train is now three hours behind schedule. Apparently, this train was supposed to make a stop at Coney Island, to pick up all of the park goers, and she doesn't seem to see a problem with picking up families from an amusement park with a wrecked subway car covered in blood. Uh, as the detectives are finishing up their investigation, taking pictures, trying to gather fingerprints and other evidence, we notice that a large blue light flash is occurring with a buzzing sound behind them as they exit the train. On the next page, while we don't see what materializes from that flash, we can only assume it's pretty terrible given the reactions of terror coming from all the police officers' faces. Outside of the subway station, we see Smithers and Harris showing up to the crime scene to join the investigation. And, of course, Smithers is a giant sexist, being a real jerk to Harris. But, kudos to her, she totally calls him on it and shows that she's not going to be pushed around by him. Then they suddenly hear all the gunfire and explosions and fighting that's taking place within the subway station. They run down the stairs. Smithers calls for backup. Pedestrians who are running for their lives are telling them to get out of there, that it's terrible. Smithers, of course, is saying, we should wait for backup. Let's not help. Whereas Harris wants to jump into it because she's not going to just take this lying down that people are in danger. 
And here on the final two pages of the story, we get a full two-page spread of absolute 90s goodness. Two, what appear to be giant rock alien monsters. One, weird alien cyborg guy with an arm that's asymmetrical and nearly the size of his entire body. And also some sort of crazy laser weapon. Everything about both of these pages screams, it's 1993, and you better be ready for everything that we can throw at you from outer space. So here we have an advertisement for Bowen Board in Scottsdale, Arizona, featuring an illustration of Pitt by Dale Keown. On the next page, we have a Sam Keith image of Pitt and of Timmy. I really like that this was being done at this time in image where one creator would let another creator take a, a shot at drawing their characters in their own style. Sam Keith, of course, having such a unique and different art style from really most anyone else in the industry, not just at that time, but in this day and age as well. Uh, it was really cool to see someone who draws so differently from Dale take a shot at a character that he created and just really put such a unique spin on it. Um, Sam's artwork is just almost caricature-like in some instances, but then there's other times where it's just hyper-realistic and there's always this weird mesh between the two of them and the way he draws. I, I really enjoy seeing Dale let another artist take a chance or just allowing someone else to give their own creative view to something that he created. The next page, of course, featuring an illustration by Jim Somerville. Once again, another artist given the freedom to just put their own creative touches on Dale's creation. I really like that this one, you know, fully going after the the whole, you know, rage monster aesthetic of Pitt, whereas Sam Keith took a chance on giving Pitt a more softer side, having him sit with Timmy, look a little more vulnerable. That's what it's cool about seeing other artists take a chance and take a shot at these creations because you get to see a character in lights that it may not have been shown otherwise. Uh, here we also have a winter sale happening at the American Comics and Entertainment Store in Gainesville, Virginia. I don't know if that store still exists, but apparently it was there in 1993, and they were definitely selling some Valiant comics. This next page was actually really cool for me to see because I had completely forgotten until I saw this advertisement just how much Wizard Magazine was featuring Image in their early years. Uh, at this point, Wizard is barely a year old, and they are just pushing the heck out of Image Comics. You can see here Spawn featured on the cover of issue number 11. You have Wildcats featured on issue number 12. You have Wetworks featured on issue number 15. It's shocking to look at Wizard at this point and just see how much they were really trying to push independent comics. Uh, again, I mean, did it really help with Image's early success? I think it played a part. Uh, Wizard Magazine at that time was way, way big in the industry, and getting featured on the cover of Wizard was really a huge push for your book. Uh, on the next page, we see this fantastically awesome advertisement for Terminator 2, the arcade game, the Super Nintendo game, and the Game Boy game by LJN, one of the only good LJN games ever made. This was awesome to see. Takes me back to a lot of quarters I wasted. On the next two pages, we see two full-page ads for Malibu Comics. I did forget to mention in the last video that Malibu Comics was actually printing all of the Image Comics for the first year, I believe, at least, of Image's existence. Uh, Image was not set up at the time to actually print books and was relying on Malibu to help them out with that aspect of their business. Uh, we see an advertisement here for the mighty Magnor and also Dinosaurs for Hire. 
I don't recall ever reading or seeing either one of these books ever in my life. However, Dinosaurs for Hire looks awesome. If this is Dinosaur Mercenaries, I'm in. I don't care if the comic is crazy, if it's weird. I want to see what Dinosaurs for Hire was about. And if I ever find one of these books, I promise I will buy it and it will be on this channel. So here on the final page of the book, we see an advertisement for a contest sponsored by both Sunsoft and DC. Uh, some of you may know that DC was in an agreement with Sunsoft to produce video games. Sunsoft, of course, made both of the Batman video games on the original NES. They're both great games, and if you ever have a chance to play either one of them, go ahead and do it. You won't be disappointed. I thought it was really unique to see this, though. It wasn't the kind of thing I was expecting to catch in an image comic. You know, these advertisements for uh, a contest that focuses completely around DC characters. The, the whole point of the contest being that if you won, you got to be featured in a Batman or a Superman comic. Um, but it was really just kind of surprising, you know, that because so many of the founders of Image were all coming from... DC or Marvel because they were so fed up with working for those companies that now the one of those companies was paying to have an ad run in an image book. It was really kind of funny to see. On the reverse inside cover, we noticed that we see image info, which wasn't really anything more than just image, just letting people know what books were coming up, um, what those books were about in a little bit of way. We do see a cool little image right here of a black and white version of the cover for Spawn number 10. This was something else I had forgotten until I reread this book that Pitt didn't come out in 92 with a lot of the other early founders of Image books. Uh, it came out in 93, which isn't weird or anything. It just kind of threw me for a loop because you, you think back through your memory and you just kind of have this idea that all of these books came out right away, right when the company started. And they didn't. There was a staggering to them, which probably was the better business model. But it's just odd to go back and realize that, you know, for Pitt being considered to be one of those original image characters, he wasn't part of the first year of image. Um, it was really kind of interesting to go back and learn something new like that, that I never knew or just completely forgot. And that concludes our look at pit number one. I really love this book. It was so much fun to read this again. This is such a fantastic representation of just angst filled early nineties, action packed comics, superheroes, just going out, getting it done killing people, over-the-top violence, crazy storylines, stuff that doesn't necessarily make sense, but it didn't have to. This was such a fun time for the comic book industry, and I definitely miss seeing these kinds of books. Uh, if you enjoyed today's video, feel free to like. Um, you can subscribe if you want to see more of my content. Uh, feel free to comment on the video. I'll try to respond to as many as I can. Uh, thanks for stopping by. Hope to see you on the next video. Have a great day.